Oh, Heavenly Father, what a wonderful moment again that uh, we can be into thy presence and praise thee and give you glory and honor. Thank you for the sky that will hold it because you are the creator of it and uh, at the appointed time you shall bring the rains. But more so may the rain of the Holy Spirit continually flow in our hearts that we may be able to know what is truth and the power accompanied by it that we may walk in it. And so draw closer to us Help us to draw closer to thee as we go through this session. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> and so, welcome again, brothers and sisters, Minneapolis 1888 and the law in Galatians. I really want to thank the Lord for the previous two messages that we have heard. And uh, I hope that uh, we are understanding the issues at stake. And uh, we are coming closer to our Lord. Uh, and uh, as he continues wooing us unto him, that we will see his loveliness even in his son and accept him as he is. There are two things that uh, I'll not like just to pass by that has been presented in the two sessions that have passed. Brother Zadok mentioned the issue to do with the, uh, the lawyer. And uh, he was talking about uh, Christ being our advocate and Brother Eric was talking about uh, uh, Christ in the law. For those who have been able to attend any court case, I hope we understand this matter so well. If uh, you would want your case to go through, what you need is a strong lawyer, a lawyer who understands the law of the country very well and can maneuver around it so well. This is how the civil courts works. And so in this scenario of a religious crisis and the sin problem, we need a lawyer who really understands the law that has been broken, how somebody can go around it. And there is no way around the law, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so if we ever needed a strong lawyer, it is at such a time as this. Because Christ is the embodiment of that law, it is the exact person we need to go through this crisis. Minneapolis, 1888. The issues at stake in the gospel in Galatians. We went through this and I'd like to pick it from where we left. Here was the president of general conference via Iowa conference president, J.H. Morrison. And he had recently resolved that the law in Galatians is the ceremonial law. And then on the paper, he had said, number two, resolved that the law in Galatians is the moral law, and he wanted Wagner and A.T. Jones to sign this. Such a movement, the prophet of the Lord says, were uncalled for. The Jewish school, right then in this scripture, Galatians 3.24, the Holy Spirit, the apostle, is speaking especially of the moral law. The Lord will sin to us and causes us to feel our need of Christ and to flee to him for pardon and peace. It is only Christ that can be able to help us go through this judgment and have victory. P.J. Wagon, a series of nine articles in the science which he claimed that the law in Galatians is the moral law. And uh, speaking about these things, this is what the prophet of the Lord says concerning these uh, controversial issues in 1888. It is in 1888, material page 840, paragraph three, she says, the same spirit of resistance is to be found even among those who claim to believe the truth of this for this time. 
The gospel of Christ, his lessons, his teachings have had but very little place in the experience and the discourses of those who claim to believe the truth. Any petty theory, any human idea becomes of the gravest importance as sacred as an idol to which everything must bow. Men had been taught to look unto men and their theories, and this is what brought out the controversy in 1888 and the law on Galatians. And as uh, Washburn said, actually the problem, as E.G.Y. told him, was not about the law in Galatians, but righteousness by faith. And this is what we are looking at. The prophet continues in 1888, material page 841, paragraph one. And I like going through history. I, uh, as Eric deals with the issues at hand, I deal with the 1888 as Brother Bran and Zadok goes through the sanctuary on the same topic. This has verily been the case in the theory of the law in Galatians. Anything that becomes such a hobby as to usurp the place of Christ, any idea so exalted as to be placed where nothing of light or evidence can find a lodgment in the mind, takes the form of an idol to which everything is sacrificed. Remember what Eric was saying, that Christ in the law. The law in Galatians is not a vital question and never has been. Those who have called it one of the old landmarks simply do not know what they are talking about. It never was an old landmark and it never will become such. These minds that have been brought, wrought up in a such an unbecoming manner and have manifested such a fruits as have, as have been seen in the Minneapolis meeting, they may well begin to question whether a good tree produces such evidently bitter fruit. I say, though through the word given me of God, those who have stood so firmly to defend their ideas and position on the law in Galatians have need to search their hearts as with a lighted candle to see what man of spirit has actuated them. With Paul, I will say, who hath bewitched you? Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Galatians 3, 1, what satanic persistence and obstinacy has been evidenced? I have had no anxiety about the law in Galatians, but I have had anxiety that our leading brethren should not go over the same ground of resistance to light and the manifest testimonies of the Spirit of God and reject everything to idolize their own supposed ideas and petty theories. We are, as I have been shown constantly, liable to error in laying too much stress even on sound ideas in proper form. So when we take even sound ideas and proper forms and turn them into idols, we push the people of God away. Those peculiarities which are not required, if allowed to become so distinct, lessen the force of the position we are compelled to hold upon sound, essential truth that will distinguish us as God's peculiar people. We take something and put it at the top as if we were putting Christ there and the people are pushed away because they don't see that such a forced religion comes from Jesus Christ. It is this face in the religious world that has divided up God's professed people. He says, faith, love, and holiness are the essentials that give true power to the truth for this time. And the world has been dying to see the love that Christians can manifest instead of their theories which they have idolized in place of idolizing Jesus Christ. The manifest absence of this, the little many have known of Christ and the little we preach Christ lesson have been a telling witness against Seventh-day Adventists. What has been a tale against Seventh-day Adventists? The uplifting of theories and making them idols instead of putting Christ where he is to be. The absence of faith, love, holiness, this has been a telling witness against Seventh day Adventists. Do you find, do you start understanding where our problem is? There is no faith, there is no love, and there is no holiness. Yet the theories are idolized and put in a place where if you don't follow them, then you are persecuted. Yet you will say anything against Christ, his temple, and his sanctuary, but nothing shall be taken care of. 
the prophet laments and says this at last, I am forced by the attitude my brethren have taken and the spirit evident to say, God deliver me from your ideas of the law in Galatians. If the receiving of these ideas will make me so unchristian in my spirit, words and works, as many who ought to know better have been. And I say with the prophet, may the Lord deliver me from the ideas of one true God, health reform, grace reform, and any other doctrine, if receiving of these ideas will make me so unchristian in my spirit. I see not the divine credentials accompanying the doctrines. I am warned again and again of what will be the result of this warfare you have persistently maintained against the truth the idolizing of the theories of men whether it is truth or whether it's not truth if christ is not the one which is preached in these things then they better be relinquished because they add no value of, to the listeners or the hearers of the messages no wonder seventh day Adventist work has been made a mountain that could have been climbed or flattened if faith, love could have preceded the very thing they theorize and make them idols. So, the gospel of liberation in the book of Galatians. This is the topic. We are viewing everything at the standpoint of 1888 and why the message was rejected, why the message has to come back again and how it has to prepare the people of God for eternity. Saved by grace through faith, plus or minus nothing. This is the problem in the book of Galatians. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but the, by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we, you have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh, Jew or Gentile, be justified. By receiving Jesus Christ, you receive the embodiment of the law. And so the secret is not is hidden, not the works of the law, but by the reception of Jesus Christ himself. Let's enter into some of the, the definitions of these things. The meaning of the word justify is made righteous. Justicia, which is righteousness, fire, which is to make. To justify is to make righteous. And... Uh, Time and time again, we are told, can a leopard change his skin? Or can a people who are accustomed to doing evil do any good? If Christ is not indwelling, it will be a putting on of a sheep's clothing while the inside is a leopard. So only Christ can change the leopard's skin. And only the embodiment of, only the reception of the life of Jesus Christ can the embodiment of the law be obeyed in our hearts? Continued on. Why can the righteous law justify? There, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The main purpose of the law, as sin even abounded, so actually the law was to make sin more grievous so that the people may flee to the medication. The law was not to make anyone righteous, but it has been theorized and idolized to the extent that pe people think that the law is the natural remedy for the sin. No, the natural remedy for sin is the blood of Jesus Christ himself. By receiving his life, you have the natural remedy. Romans 7, 12, where for the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. That is what it shows us. It shows us the character, that the character of God is good, but the law will never impart that character. The life of Christ helps us now to receive that character. Romans 7, 10, And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death, for sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it it slew me. The law which declares all men to be sinners could not justify them except by declaring that sin is not sin. And that will not be justification, but self-contradiction in the law. The law points us to the one who is able to live all the righteousness of the law. 
We read the written law and find in it our duty to play, made plain, but we have not done it, therefore we are guilty. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none that doeth good, not, not even one, Romans 3, 23, verse 12 also. And so what we main with is condemnation. And see how uh, actually uh, uh, Paul counsels out this condemnation. In Romans chapter 7, Paul is struggling with the law of sin in the members of his body. And he's asking, oh, what a wretched man, what will happen to me? And he says, no, there's no now condemnation in them who are in Jesus Christ. Paul doesn't say in Romans chapter eight, to cancel what is happening in Romans chapter seven, he doesn't say that now I have found peace in obeying the law. There's nothing like that. He says that there's now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. They have been freed from the law of sin. Where the law was condemning them, now it looks at Jesus Christ, Christ in them the hope of glory, and it says, Son, you are accepted in Christ. No name under heaven or earth has been given for the salvation of men, but the name of the man Jesus Christ. In him alone is the satisfaction of the law to be found, not in anything else. Uh, else. Yeah, so, moreover, there is not one who has strength to do the law. It is requirement are so great. Then it is very evident that no one can be justified by the works of the law, and it is equally evident that the fault is not in the law, but in that individual or in the individual. Let the man get Christ in the heart by faith and then do the righteousness of the law will be there also. I delight to do thy will, O oh my God, here the law is within my heart. God will remove the guilt, will make the sinner righteous. That is in harmony with the law. And then the law which before condemned them will witness to their righteousness. Remember the statements that were read in midday. That uh, the law is the righteousness and the only way a man can partake of it is to have Christ in their lives. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The danger has been presented to me again and again of entertaining as a people false ideas of justification by faith. I have been shown for years that Satan would work in a special manner to confuse the mind on this point. The prophet continues, let the subject be made distinct and plain that it is not possible to effect anything in our standing before God or in the gift of God to us through creature merit. Should faith and works purchase the gift of salvation for anyone, then the creator is under obligation to the creature. If by doing the works of the Lord, then he can merit heaven, then the sacrifice of the Son of God is of none effect. The prophet continues, here is an opportunity for falsehood to be accepted as truth. If any man can merit salvation by anything he may do, then he is in the same position as the Catholic to do penance for his sins. Salvation then is partly of debt that may be earned as wages. If this is what God is requiring us to do, to obey his law so that we may merit heaven, then why give his son? But by reception of his son, then the fruit of salvation is seen in our life because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation and the just shall live by faith. What is faith? Faith is uh, the substance of those things hoped for. Christ in us manifesting the works of the law, the eternal salvation. The idea of doing anything to merit the grace of, of pardon is fallacy from beginning to end. Lord in my mind, no price I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. This should be the song of every child of God who thinks that he will be able to enter heaven. Nothing else. There is danger in regarding justification by faith as placing merit on faith. When you take the righteousness of Christ as a free gift, you are justified freely through the redemption of Christ, faith and work. But there you have to read this compilation of uh, faith and works. It is so good. It defines how these things are blended and how Christ is working in the person who has believed in him. There is danger in regarding justification by faith as placing merit on faith. When you take the righteousness of Christ as a free gift, you are justified freely through the redemption 
of Christ. When ma men learn they cannot earn righteousness by their own merit of work, and they look with firm and entire reliance upon Jesus Christ as their only hope, there will not be so, so much of self and so little of Jesus Christ. Let me pause here and say something. If uh, our salvation hangs upon our righteous doing, then there should be actually a different kind of wages because there are others who are so righteous and others are not righteous. There are other people who stumble so much and others don't stumble so much. And so if our salvation hangs upon the obedience of our own, then there are those who are to receive higher wages than the others. And it means that there are others who are entitled to some extent of eternal life and others are not actually entitled to such a life because they have done good to some extent, but in other parts they have not performed well. Yet others have done so good, uh, uh, have done so bad and so good little. And so if our works stands as the merit for our salvation, then it means that we have to live some years into eternity and be cut off because our righteousness was not a constant righteousness. It was something on and off. And so if it is wages, then it will not be same wages. It will not be eternal life for everyone because not everyone have done the works to fully perfection or the same works that are needed in, uh, in this work of uh, uh, righteousness getting righteousness. Souls and bodies are defiled and polluted by sin. The heart is entrenched from God. Yet many are struggling in their own finity strength to win salvation by good works. Jesus, they think, will do some of the saving. They must do the rest. They need to see by faith the righteousness of Christ as their only hope for time and for eternity. There is this kind of... Uh, thought that uh, I, I should do some and Christ should do some. No, it is the work of Christ from the beginning to the end. Unless we are saying that salvation is a wage that we have to get from the Lord, then we have to outperform others or perform this and that. Christ, what is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in dust. This is the thing. The glory of man has always plunged people in positions that they should be not. People seeking their own wise ideas, self-exaltation have ended in places or made men go into places they should not go. And so the work of justification is to lay the glory of man in dust and doing for man that which is not in his power to do for himself. As sin is supernatural, so the salvation itself is supernatural and man doesn't have that power unless he has the life of Christ in them. When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so these are some of the sentiments that we get when we are dealing with the justification by faith. In the case of grown-up persons, some dispositions are required on the part of the sinner in order to fit to obtain his, this uh, uh, habitual and abiding grace of justification. This is a false theory, and we are going to see it, that... Uh, some dispositions are required in adults to merit their salvation. What does, what is the truth? This is a Catholic belief, page 74. The correct position is this. If you see your sinfulness, do not want to make yourself better. How many there are who think they are not good enough to come to Christ? Do you expect to become better through your own efforts? There is help for us only in God. We must not wait for a stronger persuasions, for better opportunities or for holier tempers. We can do nothing of ourselves. We must come to Christ just as we are. The issue of waiting to seem good in the eyes of Christ so that you may be accepted is righteousness by works. And the prophet is saying this cannot earn anyone salvation. A man, Catholic belief, a man can dispose himself only by the help of divine grace and the disposition which he shows do not by any means affect effect or merit justification. They only serve to prepare him. So while man is doing good, he is preparing for justification. But what does the truth say? In steps to Christ, page 33, he is wooing by his tender love the hearts of his erring children. 
no earthly parent could be as patient with the faults and mistakes of his children as is God with those who seeks to save, who, whom he seeks to save. And so it is Christ wooing us by his spirit. He doesn't wait for us to be good. Think about the prodigal son, the story that we know so well in the book of Luke 15. The father does not wait for him to be good to actually embrace him and accept him in the house. But he lets the child, he is have been waiting for the child and the sympathy has been with him. And then when the child shows up, the Lord doesn't even consider, the father doesn't consider the rugged clothes that he is in. Right away he says that slew the fattest lamb and let us have the celebration. We, before even I change his raiment, he is given a signet ring of acceptance and there and then justification takes place. This uh, doctrine of uh, waiting to be good, to be accepted in Christ is nothingness but only false ideas. No one could plead more tenderly with the transgressor. No human lips ever poured out more tender entreaties to the old wanderer than he does. All his promises, his warnings are but the breathing of unutterable love. We have been used to seeing thou shalt not do as prohibitions and utterances of condemnation and warning, but these are utterances of love. When Satan comes to tell you that you are a great sinner, look up to your Redeemer and talk of his merit. You don't have to show Satan that I was good yesterday. No. Show him the merits of thy Savior. That which will help you is to look to his life. Acknowledge your sin, but tell the enemy that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and that you may be saved by his matchless love. Steps to Christ 35, 36. Another belief in Catholic belief 26. It says, we stand in continual need of actual graces to perform good works both before and after being justified. The good acts, however, done by the help of grace before justification are not strictly speaking meritorious, but serve to smooth the way to justification to move God. Now you tell me how you can please God in any way by performing anything good so that he may justify you. These are the some of the beliefs that permeate even Adventism, that for us to be accepted and justified, we have to smooth way. God is not somebody whom you can say that you are smoothing his heart to justify you by doing anything good. Such a Catholic beliefs are actually what is preventing justification in taking place. In text to Christ 7, 57, 58. But even this parable, tender and touching as it is, comes short of expressing the infinite compassion of the Heavenly Father, the parable of the prodigal son. The Lord declares by his prophet, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Continued on. While the sinner is yet far from the father's house, wasting his substance in strange country, the father's heart is yearning over him, and every longing awakening the soul to turn to God is but the tender pleading of his spirit, wooing, entreating, drawing the wanderer to his father's heart. But we are told that this parable falls short of expressing what justification and the love of God is. With the rich, with the rich promises of the Bible before you, can you give place to doubt? Can you believe that when the poor sinner longs to return, longs to forsake his sin, the Lord sternly withhold him from coming to his feet in repentance? Away with such a thoughts. Nothing can hurt your soul more than to entertain such a conception of your heavenly Father. It is the misapprehension of God's character that has brought darkness in this world, and the message of justification by faith has to do away with this misapprehension of God's character. The nefarious opinion of the papists which attribute the merit of grace and the remission of sins to works must here be emphatically rejected. That is Martin Luther. Martin Luther also says, the papists say that a good work performed before grace has been obtained is able to secure grace for a person because it is no more than right that God should reward a good day. And so, he says, when grace has already been obtained, any good work deserves everlasting life as due payment and reward for merit. Who said that? Can a person say that I have done good so 
God opened the pearly gates for me to enter in. Is that the kind of notions we have on justification by faith that they should, our works should merit at salvation? For the first, God is not data, they say, but because God is a good and just, it's no more than right, they say that he should reward a good work by granting grace for the service. Martin Luther says, now if I could perform any work acceptable to God and deserving of grace, and once having obtained grace, my good works will continue to earn for me the right and reward of eternal life. Why should I stand in need of the grace of God and the suffering and death of Christ? Christ will be of no benefit to me. Christ must be of no use to me. If my continual doing of good works can bring me into possession of eternal life, then what is the need of the life of Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary? With Paul, we absolutely deny the possibility of self-merit. God never yet gave to any person grace and everlasting life as a reward for merit. The opinion of the purpose are the intellectual five dreams of idol pets that serve no other purpose but to draw men away from the true worship of God. The purpose is found upon hallucinations. This is what the purpose is founded upon. Hallucinations ideas which seems like visions and dreams, but in the actual sense, they are perversion of the gospel. We are told the true way of salvation is this. First, a person must realize that he is a sinner. The kind of a sinner who is congenitally unable to do any good thing. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Those who seek to earn the grace of God by their own efforts are trying to please God with sin. They mock God and provoke his anger. The first step on the way to salvation is to repent. I'll see where I can reach on this. But when grace has already been obtained, they continue God is in the position of a debtor and is in a duty bound to reward a good work with the gift of eternal life. This is the wicked teaching of the purpose. Shall we say that our life in heaven will depend on performing good things in heaven? If our being in heaven, even if eternity, will be based on our performance in heaven, then God is a debtor to man. And then he needs to reward man by his obedience. But far from us be such a doctrines, and this is what is found in a minister. The scholastics explain the way of salvation in this manner. When a person happens to perform a good deed, God accepts it and as a reward for the good deed, God pours charity in that person. They call it charity infused. This charity is supposed to remain in the heart. They get wild when they are told that this quality of the heart cannot just by a person. So the work of a person is to do good, and that is when charity is infused in the heart. Instead of charity working it out, you work and then the charity is given in the heart. You see how these ideas that permeated the Galatians were against righteousness by faith. Martin Luther says, to give a short definition of a Christian, Listen, and this is wonderful. A Christian is not somebody who has no sin, but somebody against whom God no longer chokes sin because of faith in Christ. This doctrine brings comfort to consciences and serious trouble. When a person is a Christian, he's above law and sin. When the law accuses him and sin wants to drive the witch out of him, a Christian looks to Christ. A Christian is free. He has no master except Christ. A Christian is greater than the whole world. This is the definition of the father of justification by faith. E.G. White says, the honest and good heart of which the parable speaks is not a heart without sin, for the gospel is to be preached to the lost. Christ said, I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance, Mark 2.17. He has an honest heart who yields to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He confesses his guilt and feels his need of the mass and love of God. He has a sincere desire to know the truth that he may obey. The good heart is a believing heart, one that has faith in the word of God. Just as the Martin Luther has said, 
a good Christian is the one that looks unto Christ. Without faith, it is impossible to receive the word. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11, 6. These issues on justification by faith should uh, permeate our hearts, should be drive in our hearts, that we may have a correct balance of what is justification and what actually the grace of Christ does in our heart. The Lord says that if I'm in your heart, then you are able to keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. It is the love of Christ in the heart that makes a person be able to overcome sin because he continually looks unto Christ. And then he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No other thing can make us be overcomers but looking unto Jesus Christ, not looking unto self. And it is for us to actually cooperate with the divine agencies and make our calling an election sure in Christ. It is to seize every opportunity that has been given in our life. And so we cannot drift into the Galatians theory that we start by faith and then finish it by works. The devil had brought about suppositions in the church of Galatians, which made them think that justification and righteousness is actually works plus faith, or faith plus works, or faith and works. But this is far from the truth. It is the work of Christ saving the sinner from the beginning to the end. As I come to an end, Amazing Grace, page 319, paragraph 3. Look at this wonderful uh, quote. Look at this quote, Amazing Grace, page 319, paragraph 3. Man can accomplish nothing without God, and God has arranged his plan so as to accomplish nothing in the restoration of the human race without the cooperation of the human with the divine. So man can accomplish nothing without God. And the only thing we can do is to cooperate with God because he can force us or can't force anything from us. It says, the part man is required to sustain is immeasurably small. Think about that for a minute. That in this whole scenario of salvation and justification, the prophet of the Lord says, the part man is required to sustain is immeasurably small. Yet in the plan of God, it is just that part that is needed to make the work success. And what is this part that man has to play in the plan of justification and salvation? As the, man, as the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. Our work is to cooperate and we become omnipotent. The part that we have to play is so small, yet that part is the word is so essential. To surrender our heart. The soul that is yielded to Christ becomes his own fortress, which he holds in a vaulted world, and he intends that no authority shall be known in it but his own. A soul thus kept in possession by the heavenly agent this is impregnable to the assholes of Satan. And so, when you look at the theme of justification by faith, the part that we have to play is so small, yet essential, and that part is the surrender of the will. If we can surrender that will, then God can do nothing. And the will is the one that governs everything. If the will is surrendered, and then Christ takes the possession of that will, then always we shall be able to behold Jesus Christ. And when we see his lovely image, we have an abhorrence of sin, just as Christ by thought and by deed abhorred sin. There is no way you can continue looking at the lovely image of Jesus Christ and continue to be a sinner. No way. And so everyone may decide today to place his will on the side of Christ and leave the rest with Christ to be able to perform his own goodwill in us. Without surrendering our will, as we are told in Steps to Christ, page 43, it is impossible for us to be saved. We are told that the greatest battle to be ever fought in this world is the surrender of will to God. After we have done that, we must expect to be justified. 
Christ cannot force our will. And we can match every battle because we are in Christ who defeated all the four, or who defeated Satan on the, on the cross. And Christ promises, if you give me your will, I'll make you to be a Christian. This is the part we miss a lot. And so I'll read this in closing, Mount of Blessings, page 142, paragraph one. Let us forget about the doctrines in Galatians and how the Galatians wanted to be made righteous. Let us look unto Jesus Christ, the author and finish of our faith. He says in, in closing, but if you are willing to be made willing, God will accomplish the work for you. Even casting down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bring it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Second Corinthians 10.5. Then you will work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his own pleasure, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. It is only by possessing Christ in the heart, then we are made Christian. The Galatians had a problem. It is the same problem that Christendom fails, uh, finds itself in. Faith and works, faith plus works, and then you are justified. The papists have the same problem, that a man must smoothen away. And Paul says, who has bewitched you Galatians? Now you started in faith, you have to accomplish by works. And now you observe months, days, you observe years for you to be accepted before God. And not that these things that we say, we have done this, we have done this, and then we are deserving the meritorious grace we are deserving to be admitted in heaven because we have been good in this and that. I pray that uh, the issues that affected the church of Galatians will not be the same issues that affect the church of Christ and that we have false ideas of what is justification by faith. May the Lord save us from this outperformance that we have to be accepted before him. We cannot bribe God we cannot smoothen our paths. Even if it were not for the drawing of the Holy Spirit, the sinner cannot be brought unto repentance. And so I thank the Lord that these messages can have a practical impact in our lives that we shall not drift into the paths of the Galatians. May the Lord be with us and continue teaching us as even we shall be going into the issue of the two Adams and justification and the 1888 messages in the coming presentation, where we shall look at uh, uh, how are we born and how can we overcome in this life? Why is Christ humanity so important in our lives? And God willing, we shall be able to find out what really the word of God says and not what are the suppositions of men. Let us bow down for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this afternoon. Thank you for holding the reins. And thank you for thy love and thy grace. Lord, there's nothing good in us that can merit our salvation. If we could combine all the righteousness of every holy man that ever lived and present them before the gates of heaven as a reward for our salvation, Lord, it will be called treason by the angels. We don't want to commit such a mistake. And so we come before thee in the name of thy son. Accept us and make us whole again and make us Christian to reflect the character of thy son. Take us through this Sabbath afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen.